first lecture will be held by Frederic Vital. Um, Frederic um, is a uh, has a scientific background in weather and climate, and over 20 years of expertise in operational probabilistic forecasting and numerical uh, model development at ECMWF, which is the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, and provides um, arguably the best weather forecast across the world. Um, he is also uh, the co-chair of the S2S um, working group uh, under the World Meteorological Organization. Frederick, please go ahead, share your screen and welcome. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'll share my screen now. Yes, please. Okay, can you see it? Yes. yes. Are we go full please screen? See. Okay, so thank you very much for this uh, invitation. So it's a pleasure so, to give a talk at the ASP. So um, I will give so, this talk on subsidial to signal prediction, which would be a sort of the main goal of this talk is to set up the scene. So it will be a relatively general talk, which we'll uh, try to do a uh, sort of general overview. We will, of course, have much more details on any components in the, in the next talks. So first question is, um, I uh, wanted to, want to, to ask is what is a, what is subsidial to signal prediction? I mean, there has been several definitions around. I mean, S2, what we call S2S. Um, sometimes it's referred to the time range between two weeks and uh, up to a decade. Uh, here, uh, we'll have a more restrictive uh, view on S2S. Uh, we we'll use the most restrictive definition of S2S, which is more the original definition, which is the time range between two weeks and the season. So that is time range between uh, weather forecasting and uh, seasonal forecasting. Um, so, if we look at the two, uh, at weather forecast in one side and signal on climate prediction in the other side, uh, both of them have a lot of commonalities. For our atmosphere, we use the same, uh, same type of model, so we solve the same law of physics. Uh, but there are some, also some significant differences. Um, the numerical weather predictions were started in the 1950s. So, this is a picture of the team behind the first. Uh, a successful weather forecast uh, that was with the ENIAC in Princeton. So you have von, von Neumann, the second from the left, Jules Charney is here. So it has quite a long history, weather forecasting, and uh, it's essentially an atmospheric initial condition problem. So here the issue is to, the problem is to, to try to have the best estimate as possible of the initial conditions, so get as much uh, observation as possible, and then uh, use a numerical model to propagate those initial conditions in time so to predict their evolution. Um, usually, those models are relatively used, operationally are relatively high resolution models. For global models, so the state of the art uh, model in operational centers have a resolution of about no, 10 kilometers. We have much higher resolution, of course, for uh, regional models, which can go to a few hundred meters. Uh, usually, they have a low complexity, which what I mean by that is usually the boundary forcing for the atmosphere is usually uh, persisted. We use often persisted SST, CIs. Uh, because as system range, it is assumed that those variables don't vary enough to, to, to have a significant impact on, on the weather. Uh, what we have to do is to predict synoptic scale event, to predict the weather uh, at a given location for a given time and, uh, in a, as precise way as possible. And uh, following the work by um, uh, the, the predictability at this time range at the limit of about uh, two weeks. Uh, this is due to the fact that a small perturbation, small in the initial condition, can give a completely different, uh, different solution. Uh, seasonal climate prediction, on the other hand, started also in the early 50s by uh, Norman Phillips. And here, uh, the, the, the justif physical justification is different. Here is more of a, a boundary condition problem, which is sometimes referred to predictability of the second kind, uh, which means that. Um, this is due to the fact that the uh, boundary conditions, that, for example, the SST, sea ice, and land surface uh, vary uh, much, uh, very much lower than, than the atmosphere and have a predictability, uh, much, higher, much longer predictability than the atmosphere. For example, we can predict any new anomalies more than six months in advance, sometimes up to a year. So if we can predict six months in advance what would be uh, the state of the SST in the Pacific, then we can predict six months in advance their impact on the climate. Um, 
the complexity of those models is uh, much higher usually than in a uh, medium range because we need uh, to predict the uh, evolution of those boundary conditions. So we need a couple, so we need an ocean model, a CIS model. And if we go even further in time with a uh, climate prediction, we need also uh, uh, to predict the vegetations. Uh, we need a glacier on the run. So those models uh, run for much longer time than, uh, than shorter than the weather forecast. They have much higher complexity, so usually. Uh, they have a much lower resolution than the weather forecasting. Typically, resolution is a typically between 150 to 100 kilometer resolution. On here, we don't predict, we don't predict, of course, at this time range the occurrence of a specific event, a specific location, but uh, we we look at the prediction of future changes in the climate's probability distribution over a large averaging period of time. So S2S is in between those two, and uh, one challenge, of course, is that it has to combine elements of both. Uh, uh, both uh, sort of uh, both, uh, both time ranges. Um, the one issue, if I come back to this uh, plot, is that it's a time range which comes at a time where the steel of the weather that takes very low. And it's a time range which is often considered too short for the boundary condition to evolve enough to bring uh, steel beyond persistence. So for a long period of time, this time scale has been in load, has been considered a sort of predictability desert. Uh, and uh, it's only over the last uh, something 20, 30 years, and there's been a uh, renewed interest in uh, this uh, time range. So the history for this uh, S2S is much, much shorter than for weather and uh, seasonal and climate prediction. So this interest was uh, triggered by uh, the discovery of several sources of predictability. It was found that after all, it was probably, probably not such a pre predictability desert as we thought. And this is the same plot as Annie showed previously, which shows several sources of predictability at this time range. You have the MGO, you have the stratosphere polar vortex, you have NEO, uh, you have the land surface, uh, which can also play a role. And uh, also sort of main source of predictability includes the Madden Gene Association, uh, soil moisture, stratosphere initial conditions, Rossby waves, SSTCIs, maybe aerosols. So I will go now uh, to describe uh, two of them uh, with a little bit more details. We will have, of course, much more details in the, in the, class, in the lecture uh, later on today, on this week. So the first one is the Madden Gene Association. This is probably one of the most important source of creditability at this time scale. It's probably one of the pillars of the creditability for S2S. So it's uh, so the MGO is characterized by a convection which forms over the Indian Ocean and then move eastward with a speed of four to eight meters per second uh, to reach uh, the deadline uh, after about uh, 40 to 50 days. So here uh, we have the different phases of the MGO which are taken five days apart. And so we see the convection uh, moving eastward, crossing the maritime continent and going up to the deadline. Uh, the MGO continues uh, its uh, propagation around the globe, but in the upper level winds. So the MGO was, uh, of, the MGO has, of course, a very important impact in the region uh, where the, the convection is propagating, so along the, along the tropics here uh, on the maritime continent. But it, uh, it was also found to have a very strong impact on the Asian monsoon, Australian monsoons, and also the extratropics, the Rossby wave uh, the propagations, also tropical cyclone activity. So the, the MGO has actually a very large impact, uh, which uh, affect most of the area uh, of the Earth. And the MGO has a characteristic that we can predict the MGO uh, more than two weeks in advance. So that means that if we can predict the MGO more than two weeks in advance, uh, we can also predict its impact uh, more than two weeks in advance, which is uh, one important element for predictability, which is uh, an important source of predictability beyond two weeks. Another source of predictability is uh, come from the stratosphere. Uh, there are uh, due to those events called the weak vortex events. And here is, um, is an example of one of those events which took place in January 2021. Those events take place about uh, once, once a year maximum. And uh, this shows the state of the stratosphere uh, on 26 December 2020, which is close to the normal state of the atmosphere. So we have this big uh, vortex uh, above the pole, in the stratosphere above the pole. And uh, about 15 days later, uh, about 10 days later, we see this uh, pole being uh, reduced and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, replaced by, by, by this uh, feature. So the temperature above the, the, above the, the Arctic so can, can increase by about 40 degrees during this period. 
a period of time. So this is a very spectacular event, um, which, as I say, happened about uh, less than once a year, uh, but which has kind of quite significant impact on the weather uh, 30 days following those events. And there is a sort of a composite of many of those events, uh, which shows that in the 30 days following those events, uh, you tend to get a, a warm, warm temperature over Southeast Europe, a cold temperature over Northeast Europe, and, and uh, also over uh, the, the east coast of the US. Uh, so if we know now that there is a spot of extreme warming forming, then we can say something about what the, the weather may look like in the 30 next days. So um, S2S prediction is really challenging because if you look at short range forecasts, you, you expect skill every day. There are of course some times where the forecast can be badly warm, but overall there is always some skill. Uh, the S2S time scale, the skill is very low, and uh, most of the and, but there are times when the, the, you expect the skill to be, to be much higher than normal, which is due to the occurrence of those sources of predictability. Those which generate what we call a windows of opportunity for forecast skill. So for example, when you have a strong MGO, or if you have a weak vortex event happening, uh, then, then you can expect uh, the predictability to be higher in the following weeks. So here is an example uh, of uh, the prediction skill of, uh, of models. So that's the prediction skill of 1000 hectopascal over the northern, of the northern annual mode for which three in the S2S, various S2S models. So this panel shows the scale uh, at which three, so for when there is no, uh, when for neutral stratospheric vortex conditions, which is almost of the time. So we can see that the scale is relatively low, but when you have a weak vortex stratospheric, when you have a weak stratospheric vortex event in the initial conditions, then you can see that practically all, all models uh, have a scale which is higher following these weak vortex conditions. Uh, similar results are found following strong vortex conditions. Uh, for the MGO, it's uh, something that's quite similar to if you have an MGO in the initial conditions, uh, the model tends to be more skillful than when there is no MGO. So identifying those windows of opportunity is one of the main challenge for the users of uh, S2S forecast to better understand if they can, uh, if they can uh, have trust or not on those uh, forecasts. Another reason why do we do substantial seasonal predictions? Another reason, as that was already mentioned earlier, is, uh, is also the need for some application, uh, which can do benefit uh, from information at this time scale. So this plot shows, for various applications, uh, different uh, type of um, of decisions uh, that will benefit from information at different time scales. So if we take agriculture, for instance, seasonal forecasting would be important for making a choice on, on the seed. But uh, S2S prediction can be uh, useful for uh, uh, scheduling when planting exactly on when to irrigate and apply nutrients. Uh, for maritime planning, uh, this time range can be useful to designate uh, ship routing. So there's quite a large demand for prediction at this time range. And so there's quite a need for skillful forecast and reliable forecast uh, between two weeks and less than a season. So can we deliver this type of forecast? And first of all, uh, all our S2S forecasts produced. So this is a figure here from the ECMWF uh, S2S forecasting system, but it's similar in other centers. So there is a three basically part. One is the initialization part where we take as much as possible, um, uh, we collect as much all the observation uh, we, can, uh, we, we can get uh, access to. So this includes satellite, uh, satellite, uh, Data, which include also, uh, um, also buoys, uh, airplanes, and so on. And for the ocean, also we collect uh, all, all, all sorts, all, all types of observations, uh, from ship data uh, to, to to buoys. Um, and using those observations, then we use a data simulation system, which makes use of a module uh, to create uh, the initial state of the module. So, the, so then we get the best estimate of what is the current state of the atmosphere, uh, which is um, a consistent, uh, with a consistent uh, state of the atmosphere between the variables, and also has the same grid as, uh, as the model. And then we run the model uh, many times. We run it many times to sample the uncertainty in the initial conditions. Uh, as I said earlier, following Lorentz, work, uh, tiny perturbation in the initial conditions can lead to different solutions. So typically, uh, as I said, if we run about a 50 member, 50 times, uh, the couple system for a period of about 46 days, 
and we run a coupled ocean atmosphere module. And then the third stage, stage is the forecast calibration on the creation of products. So, so one question is, uh, what is the appropriate uh, type of products for this time range? Uh, once again, we are between uh, medium range and seasonal forecasting, and medium range and seasonal forecasting are very different type of products. Uh, forecast charts for medium range for short and medium range forecasting, the charts are often in the form of evolution of temperature on the daily or sub daily basis over a single point. Um, while for seasonal forecast, usually we show more the probability to be in a upper uh, normal or uh, uh, above, uh, no, above normal. So this is the typical chart for seasonal forecasting. So um, S2S forecasting is in between. And, and uh, usually um, the typical products are also like for seasonal forecast or it to be in uh, upper lower tier sites, uh, but for a shorter period of time for period, uh, for a weekly period or sometimes be weekly period. So what is the steel at this time range? And so this is uh, an example from the for instance, wave model. Uh, well, here we look at uh, rock scores. Okay, this is a probability score. I have no time to go into detail. The main point here is that the perfect score is one for the rock score, and so the higher, the better. And if your rock area, which is larger than 0 0.5, it means that your model is uh, outperformed uh, climatology. Less than 0 0.5 means you are worse than climatology. So this uh, represents the rock area computed from the ECMWF model for many uh, real-time forecasts from this ECMWF model covering several years. And this is the scale for various uh, lead times. So we see that, of course, the, the scale uh, diminishes week by week. The good news is that even at week four, there is no blue area. That means that we are always better, usually statistically, than, uh, than climatology. Um, interesting point here is that if we look at medium range forecast, uh, we can see that the skill is usually higher in the extratropics than in the tropics. Uh, usually, uh, shorter lead time, it's more difficult to predict the weather in the tropics than extratropics due to the difficulty to predict convection. At, at short, uh, while a single time range, longer time range, the skill uh, is uh, usually more concentrated in the tropics, and the skill in the extratropics is very low, uh, close to, to climatology. Uh, on an average term, of course, as I say, there are windows of opportunity where the steel is usually can be higher. Uh, but uh, which uh, four start to be uh, like, uh, much more like signal forecasting? On which uh, those two weeks, uh, day 12 to 18, 1925, uh, where the steel is more uniform, uh, are really more the transition uh, between the weather and the, uh, the longer time scale. So here we can see some steel as steel in the tropics as well as the stratropics. Um, are we, uh, in terms of skill, are we uh, filling the gap between weather and seasonal forecasting? We know that for weather forecasting, there has been a very, uh, very, uh, very uh, steady progress in, uh, in, uh, in weather prediction. And this plot shows the uh, evolution of forecasting score at ECMWF uh, since the 1980s. Uh, this, is a, this is a scale for uh, day, day three, day five, day seven, day nine. So there's been a, a progress we, we, of about one, one day of predictive skill per uh, decade, which has been quite impressive. That has been called quite a quad revolution. Uh, Sino forecasting, on the other hand, has seen very little improvements over the last uh, 20 years. And uh, here is a figure from ECMWF showing the evolution of the, for, the, the, the skill for two meter temperature of which three over the northern extratropics over the last 15 years, uh, showing quite a nice improvement. Uh, maybe not as steady as for medium range forecasting, but quite a significant improvement, uh, even if we verify against observations. So, so from in terms of uh, progress, so this shows that there's been some progress in the, in, uh, at this time range. Uh, in line with uh, the progress we have seen in weather forecasting, uh, which is another reason why uh, there has been more uh, uh, interest in this time range over the, the recent decades. And uh, the skill can be high enough to produce some uh, useful uh, forecast for, uh, for some applications. So here is an example of the super typhoon Camori, uh, which hit uh, the Philippines in, two, in uh, December 2019. Uh, so this is a forecast of medium range forecast, which of course show uh, very clearly a uh, very strong probability of, of a forecast uh, of, uh, of strike, a very strong strike probability over the Philippines. And that's a forecast of a week four, which was issued on 11 November 2019, which shows that for this specific case, 
Uh, there was quite a clear signal in the model already that there will be a high probability of tropical cyclone, uh, uh, tropical cyclone strike over the, the Philippines. So, so showing that for, for um, civil protection, this type of uh, forecast could potentially uh, be useful. It's of course only a single case. We, we need to do uh, much more, uh, much more larger statistics. So uh, I have about 10 minutes left. So I will just go briefly uh, towards uh, tools to better understand S2S prediction. And one of those tools are databases that uh, WAP, WCAP S2S project has, uh, has set up. Uh, this is a database called the S2S database, which contains a daily uh, period time forecast on reforecast from 11 operational centers. Uh, which are produced as a, with the same grid, same format, and we have about 80 variables available. And this database is hosted at the SMUF, CMA, and IRI, and is publicly available since 2015. So it's quite a huge amount of data, uh, which uh, on this, this plot show all the, the data providers. So we have currently 11 of them. Uh, you have another database, which we, you may also make, make use uh, over the past, over the next two weeks, which is a subex. Uh, which contains either real-time forecast and re-forecast from uh, several American models. Uh, an advantage of SUBEX is that the data is uh, really available in real time, whereas S2S has an embargo of three weeks because it has to be a research database. Uh, but those databases can be very useful to identify uh, those windows of opportunity and to uh, assess the skill of model and to have a better idea of uh, how usable uh, those forecasts can be for some uh, specific applications. So I have no time to go too much into details. Uh, but this is a description of the 11 uh, models in the S2S database, which forecast lanes go from 32 days to 60 days. And uh, most of them run on a daily, uh, so there is, some of them run on a daily basis with a small and several size. Other models, other centers have a different strategy. They run the model much less frequently on a weekly basis uh, or twice weekly, but with much uh, higher and several size, like at uh, SMWF or CNIM. And then we have the reforecast. So, I don't have much time to go into the, the, the reforecast, just to mention that we are producing a reforecast because at this time range, the, the model error starts to grow very quickly. And uh, they can have an amplitude which can be, can be as large as the signal we want to predict. So we produce always a reforecast uh, to have an estimate of what is the model climate. And then we can a posteriori make correction on the real-time forecast. So usually the product we show from the s 2 forecast uh, usually do, do not come directly from the model uh, real-time forecast. We need an a posteriori correction uh, to remove uh, the, the, the systematic errors from the model. So in terms of complexities, I mean, there has been uh, different strategies. Some models, like the Met Office, uh, use their seasonal forecasting system to produce S2S forecast. Some other centers, like GMA, use their, uh, more than an extension of their medium range forecast. Uh, to produce uh, S2S forecast, in which case, uh, the, as I said, the complexity of the model is, is uh, less. Uh, but usually most S2S models have a couple ocean model and most uh, start to have, a uh, majority of them have also an active sea ice model, um, which, is, uh, which is quite uh, important, as you will see in the next two weeks. Uh, it's quite important to have uh, ocean coupling for this time range and sea ice can also play an important role. So this uh, database can be useful for uh, assessing the, the, the performance of the model for specific case studies. This is, for example, for the Russia heat wave. Uh, this panel here shows um, uh, shows the temperature uh, to measure temperature anomalies over the week of 1 to 7 August 2010. There was anomaly more than 8 degrees, which is enormous for a weekly mean. And uh, this is a forecast from uh, about three weeks ahead from various models, uh, showing that. Uh, so that's an ensemble mean, but that some of them uh, capture quite a very strong anomalies. And uh, that uh, this heat wave had some predictability uh, three weeks in advance. Um, finally, I mean, this uh, S2S database, the database, uh, the BEX or S2S are also quite uh, useful tools to assess the benefit of combining models. Uh, and uh, this plot shows the uh, scale of uh, multimodal. Uh, of three, uh, based on three models, SMWF and SEP on bureau methodology, uh, showing that after uh, two weeks, uh, uh, the multimodal is uh, significantly more skillful than the best model. So this suggests that at least for precipitation, uh, multimodal combinations uh, can be, uh, uh, can help 
uh, improve the forecast scheme. So I'm close to the end. I just uh, want to mention a few challenges for stress prediction. So one big challenge is to so best to understand well the sources of predictability. I mean, we have identified some of them, but some maybe some of them are not uh, yet to be identified. And what is uh, coming more frequently now is to, to, to try to better understand all the sources of predictability interact, which is something I think we don't have a very clear picture now. And all they also interact with other time scales. Uh, for example, ENZO. I mean, there has been a recent paper showing that the impact of the MGO is not the same during an Nino or La Nina years. Uh, decadal variability must also have some impact on the, on the, on the source of predictability on the predictive scale at this uh, stress time range, on the global warming. Um, another issue is important issue is in terms of modeling the predictability at this time range comes often from remote regions. So a good S2S forecast, you need to have a good prediction of the source of predictability. So let's say, for example, the MGO. You need a good representation of the tail connections, which is the impact from one region to another. So for example, all the MGO would impact the NAO. So you need to have this pathway uh, correctly represented. And third one is a good simulation of the impact, what is the impact of the NAO on the uh, over Europe, for instance. So this means that uh, it's a long chain of events and many things can go wrong in uh, one of them. And currently, uh, most models have a problem in one, if not all of them. So model errors, we show to the next stage step, which is a model errors, including initial shock, are really a big problem. Some of those errors are linear, so, so it's more easy to remove, but so, so some are not linear, non linear, uh, which are uh, much more pro problematic. Uh, modern complexity, as I say, is needed for S2S prediction, but uh, an issue is that the new S components, for example, if you add an ocean purple system, you introduce new biases. So you may improve the model in some sense because you have better processes, better representation of processes. Uh, but you may uh, introduce some biases that can be very uh, destructive. For example, errors in the location of Western boundary currents. Uh, in a couple system, usually the Gulf Stream is uh, misplaced. And this can have uh, an impact on the, on the pathway for the tail connections. And uh, finally, I mean, uh, there is also a lot of work on going to try to understand how valuable no AI is forecast for end users. So we have a general idea of the skill, but is that useful really for uh, for a for, uh, for farmer or for, uh, for sheep protein, is it? And uh, can it be useful really operationally by some application and what are the main obstacles for their use by applications? So there is some, uh, some future uh, directions. One is to, there's a feeling now that uh, the current and sample size is not large enough to, 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 to give a proper estimate of the probability distribution function. And so there is a, so some centers like CENDOF, we are planning to have 100 members instead of 51 to, so to get more accurate estimate of probability distribution function. A couple of data estimations that was mentioned earlier, so is quite an, an important uh, new venue to get more consistent uh, system component initial conditions and reduce initial shock. Add resolution, add resolution modeling, kilometer scale may, may help to, to reduce errors uh, by, uh, for example, a lot of errors are due to model parameterizations, uh, for example, for cloud parameterizations. And if we go to much finer scale, uh, the models start to resolve directly those, uh, those processes. And uh, as was mentioned also earlier, the use of AIML for model improvement can be used for data simulation, parameterization, from, but also for attribution and also for calibration. So I will stop here just to say that so the S2S prediction is still in, in its infancy, so it has very short histories so far. It fills the gap so between weather and climate forecasting. And the predictability comes mostly from atmospheric initial conditions as well as from boundary conditions. So it's a bit of a mixture of a weather and climate problem. Uh, the S2S predictability is not constant in time. It depends strongly on the occurrence of sources of predictability. Uh, the forecast yield for weeks three, week four is generally low on average, but uh, models have improved over the past decades. And multimodal ensemble can produce more seafood forecasts for precipitation. And finally, databases such as SUBEX, S2S are valuable resources to, to evaluate the impact of various sources of predictability for, for, and, and to better understand uh, the S2S models and the potential benefit and limitation in the use of S2S forecast. Mm -hmm.